Markets are down and yields are up as the latest round of data is painting a grim picture of stagflation. With inflation climbing, growth stalling and unemployment creeping upwards, evident that the Fed will have its hands full in the next few months. And while markets did initially pull back, we have to ask ourselves, is this just a routine seasonal pullback or is there something more sinister occurring under the hood? And while the market loves to climb the wall of worry, we need to ask ourselves what happens when worry turns into a full blown panic. So with the S&P 500 trading near all time highs, we're going to have a look at sentiment, positioning and valuation to determine what might happen next and what sectors you should be looking at. Should we be bearish or should we remain bullish? We've got a lot to talk about, so let's roll the tape. Welcome everybody to the daily recap show where we talk about stocks and the financial markets. My name is Chase. If you like this video, please subscribe, hit that notification bell, like this video and leave a comment for the algorithm. Let's get into it. Today was like a flight to safety trade. I mean, we had these mega cap cash flow positive names, Microsoft, Apple, Google outperform for the most part, as well as Amazon. I guess you could somewhere what consider Amazon a defensive name just based on its retail business. We also had like Visa and MasterCard perform really well and then like Lilly, Healthcare Plans, AbV, and then Energy Green. So what is all this telling us? Okay, we got one defensive sector outperforming, one inflation hedge, and then like cash flow positive mega caps. The market's a bit worried because of the data we got. Core PPI came in hot, 2% versus 1.9. Retail sales came in weak. I mean, jobless claims came in line, but the unemployment rate ticked up to 3.9% in the non-farm print, the market's getting a bit worried because inflation is rising, growth, right, is slowing, retail sales, growth is slowing, sounds a bit like stagflation. And we saw it right here, energy, the top performing sector in second place, pretty much flat on the day technology, plus 0.05%. Then we had com services down for the day, the spy down, every other sector underperformed the spy in the red. And then we had KRE regional banks down 2.64% along with metals and minings, semiconductors and real estate. And let's actually hop on the charts and have a look at all of this. Okay, looking at indices. So the S&P 500, NASDAQ 100, both down 0.3% for the day, the RSP 0.9, and then mid caps, small caps, and the IWM took it on the chin. You know, they were down all in excess of 1%, the IWM 1.79%. Rough day of trade, volatility ticked up, yields went up, bonds sold off a little bit, and that did weigh on the smaller names. Then we also saw stuff like Bitcoin down 3.48%. I really thought Bitcoin was an inflation hedge. Where's the Bitcoin bros after today's trade? And then 1.74% up in crude. A kind of a mixed day across the board, but looking at the S&P 500, this is the weekly chart. So still on a green weekly candle, but on a daily chart, I mean, this still looks bullish. Why? Because we put in a lower low. Look at this candle. It's a red bodied candle. Yes, the bears did take us all the way down, but the bulls came in a very, very strong way at these lows right here, formed a higher low, closed at the half of the candle. Now, a win to the bears 100%. But if we actually go into the five minute chart, we actually zoom out. Look, this is where we opened right here and bears took us all the way down. We did make lower lows on the way down and we did make higher lows as well. So tomorrow, the bulls have the work cut out for them. They have to go ahead and take these key levels all the way back up to 51.76, but it might be really hard with OPEX tomorrow. Now the bears had the opportunity to get below this low right here. They really had to push for that today. Unfortunately, they couldn't. Bears closed in the upper half of this candle. And really it's looking like we're probably just gonna rally again tomorrow. Probably if we get above of this high that would be actually like a weekly closing high that would be bullish but all in all it really depends on what the overnight trade is going to look like and what yields are going to do tomorrow we have a little bit of data yeah university of michigan sentiment but ideally what's going to happen is bulls need to go ahead tomorrow capture this level capture this level bears i think bears really need to go and close sort of around here the 41 20 50 100 that's what the two sides of the coin need to do i think anything above this low is bullish for next week in my personal opinion especially now that that cpi data the inflation data is out and most of s p 500 earnings have reported all in all though looking at the longer term trend zooming out on the daily chart we are moving higher with making higher highs higher lows at all time highs and you just can't really fault the market that is bullish 
That's a very, very bullish signal. This chart looks bullish and you don't want to fight the trend. Guys, we're going to have a quick look at earnings. We're going to cover Dollar General and Adobe in depth, but looking at Dick Sporting Goods, I think their earnings was all right. Ulta had good earnings, but they got sold off. So maybe the market didn't like their guidance. And this right here, Builder Bear Workshop. I keep track of this because my brother is in this stock, right? This stock has actually 3X any of the MAG7 since the COVID lows. Absolutely crazy trade. It was up 16%. It's like a 25X in the last three years. But let's actually dive into Dollar General, guys. So they beat on EPS, they beat on revenue, but they guided for lower guidance. And we are starting to see this in the dollar stores, you know, just weaker guidance overall. And I think that has to do maybe with uh, forecast retail spending. The stock was down, I think, 4% in after hours. But overall, the financial year earnings were not too bad. Adobe beat on EPS, beat on sales. They were down 10% in after hours on soft revenue. And that's the thing. When you're trading at a 50x PE, you're going to come in with like really soft revenue, really soft guidance. Guidance, it's not going to look good for you. And they were down 10% in after hours trade. Now looking at the double A, double I sentiment survey, guys, bulls did pull back in a big way. Still very bullish sentiment nonetheless. What we didn't see with this sentiment shift in the bullish tone ever so slightly lower was it didn't coincide with bearish sentiment ticking up. So the markets overall still lack bearish conviction, but bullish conviction is waning. I think a lot of people are just taking cash sitting on the sidelines. And while sentiment is pulling back and waning CTAs trend following algorithms are also pulling back you can see we made a high right here normally when we do pull back in CTA positioning it normally does coincide with some form of a pullback the same is true to the upside however and you can see we've had quite the rally both in the S&P 500 and trend following algorithms we are starting to see a pullback we haven't seen anything this substantial since maybe early 2024 right here we need to see if this does materialize to anything more to the downside. This is for the S&P 500. Looking at the NASDAQ positioning, however, it is looking ever so slightly more grim. Number one, we actually didn't go and make that high in positioning as well as we've been in this range and at the bottom of this range right now. I do think that if we continue to do this and then continue to go lower, we should actually see the NASDAQ go lower. And especially with some of the bigger names not participating like Apple, like Google, like Tesla, we could really see the NASDAQ pull back, especially after OPEX once we have a lot of that gap wiped off the tape. Now this is mostly for short term positioning. In the longer term, we have to look at the fundamentals and the macro. And from an earnings perspective, we are expected to report Magnificent 7 growth in the first quarter 2024 of 34%, 493 growth of negative 1%. But then we see earnings ramp up in both the Magnificent 7 and the S&P 493. We see 8%, 8%, then 21% growth. And the 493 should outpace the MAG 7 by the fourth quarter of 2024. But that that is if these revisions do hold up. And typically when we're not in a recession, EPS revisions do tend to hold up. So we could somewhat have high confidence that these numbers might print. At the same time, even Russell earnings is turning up. This is year over year EPS growth for the Russell 2000. It's turned positive for the first time since September 2022. And this is a very, very good sign because when the S&P 500 did come out of its earnings recession here in September, the Russell 2000 has actually stayed in it and has actually also had a much deeper recession than the S&P 500. So this is largely positive and we do want to see continuation into the first quarter this year, second, third, fourth quarter, and hopefully we get outperformance in earnings. Now, let's actually look at valuation with regards to those earnings. This is valuation of small caps, mid caps, as well as the S&P 500 forward PE estimates. And you can see the S&P 500 currently valued at 20 times PE, very expensive historically, but then you actually go look at S&P 400, S&P 600, mid caps, small caps, trading at a 15 PE and a 14 PE. Very, very attractive relative to history. I mean, this is some of the lowest levels we actually see in PE ratios for small caps and mid caps since 2009, 2008, 2010, all the way to like here, 2013, 2014. And we do know what small caps and mid caps did from 2013 all the way to here, 2020. They went on a blockbuster rally. So I do think if you are looking for value, look at small caps, look at mid caps, particularly mid caps. I think there's insanely high quality companies here in mid caps small caps there is a, a lot of junk 
chunk in them as well. Not so much the S&P 600, but the IWM. But if you do want larger cap names, you can actually look at the equal weight. Right now, the S&P 500 trades at a 20 times earnings, but the equal weight trades at a 25% discount at about a 16, it's about a 16.2 PE for the equal weight. Now let's switch gears, actually talk about bonds. Now we got some fantastic research here from Ned Davis Research, and I'm not gonna read all of it. You can go ahead, read the key takeaways and read all of these points, but pretty much what they come out and said is that bonds are approaching short-term overbought levels right here. The 10-year treasury has rallied about 25 basis points in a few days following Powell's testimony and softer wage growth numbers. Bonds are fast approaching short-term overbought levels as shown on the chart in an intermediate term basis. However, the market is far from overbought. So short-term overbought, as you can see right here, but on a longer-term trajectory, they're far from overbought. So we could see a bit of a pullback in bonds that should coincide with a rise in yields. But we had the 30-year bond auction yesterday. It went really, really well. So I'm not sure if we are going to see the huge overreaction that Ned Davis might see. That being said, the data and key takeaways are here for you guys to use accordingly. Now, guys, sometimes when we get short-term weakness or we get like this short-term euphoria, sometimes it's good to look at the bigger picture, look at what we normally do, get back to the fundamentals. And this right here is the S&P 500 presidential cycle year four monthly average returns 1928 to present. And we can see that normally in March, we actually do have a fairly positive March. March has actually been quite positive for the most part. We have had volatility, yes, but in aggregate, it has been positive. Now we are entering the April and May period. In a presidential year, we can actually see we remain pretty much flat on April, and then we have a deep negative May. So what that means is we could actually look at April and May as dip buying opportunities for a massive rally that we get here in June, July, August. Fun fact, this right here should actually align with possible rate cuts. Now they may push that out further, but according to the data we have right now, it's looking like we might get the first cut here in June, possibly July, maybe as early as May, but it's looking more like June, July. And then after we face some near-term volatility here in September, October, we continue on to the end of year rally. This is what we expect in the fourth year of a presidential cycle. Now the election is on the 11th of November. So a lot of the pre-election volatility will happen in October, a little bit at the start of November. But then once we get certainty as to who the incumbent is going to be, whether it's going to be Joe Biden or Donald Trump, once we get that certainty, we normally do have quite a positive November and December period. All in all, do expect volatility right now and in the September, October period, it's well within seasonality. But if we also just like keep rallying from here and keep expanding the multiple, don't be surprised as well. All I'm trying to do is just give you both sides of the table and the worst case scenario as to what might happen. Just to tell you guys, don't stress, buy the dip because there's still a lot of gains to be had this year. If we actually go ahead and look at seasonality, right in aggregate versus what we're doing now, we have actually outperformed the average year seasonal period quite significantly. Now, what does this mean? We could definitely get a pullback 100%. We do normally see that in April and May, but it should just be looked at as a dip buying opportunity because we are in a momentum market. We are in a strong market. We are in an earnings driven market and all dips should be bought for an eventual rally all the way to new all time highs unless we break key key levels. So go ahead, subscribe because I will keep you updated every day on where we're looking at. Is this going to turn into a bear market, bull market, key levels to buy? Subscribe so you never miss a beat, guys. Now, this is another seasonal chart, and it's essentially the last 100 days of trading and economic periods similar to what we have now and what are the usual returns. And you can see here that 101 days were tracked, correlation cutoff was 0.93. What we normally see, again, is midterm weakness here in these charts. And then after the weakness, we actually do get pretty positive events. Now, in some instances, we can actually finish negative for the year, like right here. But all in all, we should see a bit of a pullback and then rally. Now, I say pullback pullback, but we could actually also have a correction in time that could act as a pullback and make the index cheaper on an earnings basis. So we could do this and go higher, or we could do something very similar to like this and then go higher. Either or is fine. Just be prepared for volatility if it does occur, but also don't completely go out of stocks because we could just rally higher right here. I've seen crazier things in the market. Now, this is a very, very interesting chart. It compares 2024 and 2012 and pretty much 2012 we were just coming off the GFC. We had a very, very strong rally the year prior and it continued in 2012. We had a pretty strong rally in 2011 leading up into 2012 and then 2013. Now in 2012, this black line, this is what happened. We actually rallied and we mimicked the price action we're seeing very, very closely. Then we had some near-term volatility right here and then we actually pulled back and parred all of the gains we made for the year and then went on an exceptional rally and we actually continued this rally in 2013, 2014, 
2014, 2015, 2016, and really had our first big bout of volatility around the end of 2017. So this is just an analog. It doesn't mean it's actually going to happen, but just something really interesting because our market is tracking 2020, 12 very very accurately to the day as well so you know we, we could possibly put out a top here pull back actually par all of these gains and again we have seen this type of price action before now looking at gamma not much has changed this chart is gonna look like this for the rest of the week 5200 is still the call gamma resistance so this is probably where we'll push up into opex guys what really matters right now is not necessarily what this looks like at the moment most of this opex period is pretty much done i mean the month at least we still have the quarterly opex but what we really want to be looking at right now is what does this look like after opex once all of this gamma comes off the tape we want to see where it repositions itself because this expires and then traders need to re-enter their positions are they going to take a more bearish stance are they going to take a more bullish stance are we going to stay at the 5200 that's really what matters into the opex week so this is where we are in the calendar right now we're in this week right here for the monthly opex and pretty much after this period right here we're going to see Vana and Charm flows are on holiday. Now we do have the quarterly OPEX here at the end of the fourth week. So we can still see quite a bit of positive Vana and Charm flows, but we do have a lot of gamma expiring on Friday. You can see right here that we have $384 million worth of gamma expiring checks coming off the tape, the most out of any day this month. So the big expiry is obviously on Friday. Quite a lot did come off today, 22.71 million. And then we do have 35 million coming off the tape here at the end of the month. And then again, another 84 million for the quarterly. So we may have a little bit of dealer strength into these periods right here, but ultimately what we wanna watch into the quarterly is where does the jex reposition in this chart as we enter the first week of april that's really what we want to look for guys now just something to note as well currently options max pain expiry is at 490 generally speaking max pain theory suggests that the market pricing will move to the place where the most amount of puts and calls will expire worthless for the upcoming expiry that is at the 490 level although i can almost guarantee you we're not going to get to the 490 level simply because we're just so far away from that strike is it possible 100 percent is it probable no. Now guys, we're going to be looking at a bunch of charts. It's essentially just a certain index or sector against the S&P 500 or the SPY. And it just provides and shows relative performance for how certain sectors are doing against the average. Now, if the chart is moving up, it means said sector is doing better. For example, this is semiconductors versus the SPY. You can see this chart moving up. That means semiconductors are outperforming the S&P 500. If the chart's going down, it means it's underperforming the S&P 500 and the S&P 500 would have been a better bet. So you can see here, for example, we've traded in this range for quite a number of months in semiconductors, which means the SPY and semis were making about the same gains. And then sort of November, we went on a blockbuster rally in semiconductors led by SMCI and NVIDIA, as well as Broadcom, AMD participated as well. And now we're actually forming a top year in semiconductors. We put in a top and we're trying to form a bottom. You can see we actually broke this low that we made right here. But for this to really materialize into anything significant, we probably have to go ahead and break this low or this low right here. That being said, we are seeing some weakness in semiconductors against the S&P 500. Looking at technology as a whole, you can see we've seen not necessarily as sharp of a top and a pullback in semiconductors, but tech, we have been ranging in this zone for quite a while. And I think a lot of this has to do with stuff like Apple. You know, they're simply just not participating in the rally because earnings is not quite there for Apple. The whole market's earnings is going up and Apple's facing problems in China, in EU earnings. They're in a saturated market. There's a lot of stuff going on with Apple at the moment, and this is weighing on tech as a whole. That being said, from the start of 2023 to right now, technology has handily outperformed the SPY. It's just that from around November, the SPY and tech have performed roughly about the same. Some outperformance, some underperformance. It just depends how you look at it. Looking at financials now, for the most part, the SPY has outperformed financials. But since about June, July right here, and we're looking at a pretty solid period, a nine-month period, financials has clearly outperformed the S&P 500. But we are seeing a little bit of weakness right now. We can see that 
that we formed a top right here and financials haven't been able to break that top, but we are starting to see a higher low. We're sort of just trading in this range right now. So the SPY and financials are sort of making about the same gains, same losses as you would see. It just depends who's gonna win in aggregate. There is a lot of bad news with regional banks right now, but a lot of the bigger guys seem to be brushing that off. That being said, our performance clearly overall in the SPY, but since June, July, financials have been the winners. Looking at utilities against the SPY now, we are starting to form a bottom right here, sort of early to mid Feb in utilities. They have performed pretty good this month and a little bit last month, but overall utilities have been an actual dumpster fire against the S&P 500. And I think if you have held utilities, you're probably looking at a four to 5% gain in the last six or so months. Not very good, all things considered. That being said, we are starting to see a bottom. Could this be the market getting defensive? Maybe it could also just be the market looking at value names right now and utilities do offer that type of value. I think they're the second cheapest sector in the S&P 500. Now looking at XLC Com services now in aggregate, it has completely outperformed the SPY. But if you look at it on a relative basis in the last month or so, since about the start of February, we put a top right in here and it's been downhill traffic ever since. Now there's a bottom forming right here and this has to do largely with Google. Google has rallied in the last couple of days, four or 5%. That's helping the XLC. But the reason why we've actually underperformed the SPY or the XLC has underperformed the SPY has to do with Google. It's down 10% year to date. A lot of stuff going on with Google's. There's free cash flow problems, CapEx spend, as well as just some bad press with their AI. All in all, it has paid you to be in this sector for the better part of the last year. Now looking at energy, we actually see a real bottom forming in energy names against the S&P 500. And normally when we do get these types of bottoms, energy goes on quite the rally against the S&P 500. And this is sometimes predicated on the fact that the S&P 500 does decline and energy is somewhat of a defensive sector, especially in higher inflation regimes. However, in the last year, it's paid to be in the spy over energy, but some deep, deep value people are starting to find in energy names, especially like Oxy. They're buying back their shares. They pay a good dividend. A lot of them have pretty healthy balance sheets and where oil right now is, you know, sort of near the $80 mark. It's pretty good because a lot of these companies work on $70 break even, you know, at $80, they get some pretty healthy margins out of it in aggregate. So if you're looking for value right now, Look at the XLE, look at the energy sector, even refineries are really good plays right now. Look at stuff like Oxy, they have the Permian Basin, they have like $45 oil, $40 oil break even. Kind of crazy when you look at it. And I think this is a good sector play if you are looking for value in this market. Looking at staples, it's been one way traffic here for the XL. We're kind of turning around like right here, but you really wanna go ahead and, and break these levels to see our performance in the XLP. And as long as we're in risk on mode, I don't think that's gonna change. I think that maybe this goes sideways, maybe it goes down, I think it would probably pay you more to go find better value names in discretionary against names like staples. Now looking at discretionary against staples and it's paid to be in discretionary over staples and pretty much if this chart goes up, discretionary is outperforming staples. And you can see there are pockets of strength here in staples right now. And probably since the start of 2024, they've been about the same, roughly some volatility, obviously, but for the most part, it's paid to be in discretionary. And I do think that's the sector you want to be in looking throughout 2024, 2025. Now looking at healthcare against the S&P 500, very, very volatile price action, but we are sort of forming a bottom right here in healthcare against the S&P 500. And that means we probably could be bottoming out for the most part in healthcare. And this right here from, you know, mid November to December, it actually doesn't mean healthcare is like going negative. It just means it's performing equally to the SPY and the S&P 500 is up 26%. And in this time, it looks like healthcare has done the same with periods of immense outperformance right here, early January, 2024, and then periods of complete underperformance. That being said, I do think with healthcare coming out of their earnings recession and earnings bottoming out, this is a good place to look. And I do think it will continue to outperform the S&P 500 like it has throughout history, throughout the last 10 years, it really has outperformed. Now looking at XLB against the SPY now, the SPY has completely outperformed the material sector, but we're seeing a sharp rebound right here. And this looks like it wants some momentum. It looks like it wants to go higher and I think it's going to continue. I think that mat the material sector is vastly undervalued. Look at stuff like energy, copper miners, gold miners, you know, they're really, really undervalued and we're starting to see some life come into them. I think in a period where we've had massive amounts of uh, disinflation, you know, it really does hurt the material sector. But now that that disinflation is sort of bottoming out and we're getting towards the end of it, we should continue to see the material sector outperform. And we do know that the Fed has spoken about maybe having a 3% inflation mandate. That's really going to help the 
material sector as well. And that's actually what we're seeing. This right here is a sharp bottom. It's macro driven. It's fundamentally driven. And if we go ahead and break this level right here, I think materials will go on a huge rally 2024, 2025. Now, looking at growth versus value, for the most part, growth has outperformed value for the last year. But especially in 2024, we've had this sharp uptick in growth against value. Now, we have seen a top probably put in right here. And I do think that value over the next three months is going to outperform growth. That being said, the big picture, 2024, 2025, I think it pays to be in growth. But in my personal opinion, you can have the best of both worlds. There are stocks out there that are growing earnings and trade at a very reasonable valuation. Go look at Google, PayPal, on on stuff like Uber, Instacart, Tickercart, or Maple Bear, whatever they want to call themselves. I think those are like growth at a reasonable price opinion. But for the, for, I think value should outperform in the next three months, especially after this OPEX. And that's going to be in my weekend video. I'm going to talk about the value trade coming up. So go ahead, follow me so you don't miss that video, guys. We got a price upgrade for Nvidia by Bofa. They raised their price target to 1,100. The current price is 857. So if we do get a pullback, according to Bofa, that should be looked as a dip buying opportunity to still see material upside in the stock. They still think that there's a strong pipeline of growth, AI spend, CapEx spend. They think it still trades at a compelling valuation at 37X, CY 25 PE. And they do think that the AI total addressable market is going to expand beyond hyperscalers. So right now it's driven by Meta, Apple, Google, Amazon, they do believe that the 493 is going to participate in the spend beyond 2025. Now, we also got a chart here from both. I'm just going to read it for you guys. But Nvidia exceeded upside projections on its arithmetic scale price chart. The log scale price chart shows room for more upside on NVDA with potential from 1100 to 1120, 1200 measured move. Last week's upside gap, A34, is important to hold. Pretty much both, I think, there's going to be material room for upside right there. There's a gap right here at A34, A34. Two, three. We could potentially pull back to that area right there and then run up to the measured move of 1,200 on the upper end. But if you've made it up until here, guys, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please subscribe, hit that notification bell, like this video, leave a comment for the algorithm. Cheers.